death of Abu Jahl, the most evil person of the Quraysh and the leader of the battle of the side of the pagans. And we had said that Abdul Rahman ibn Auf narrated to us the story of how he died. In the beginning of the battle, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf was surrounded by two young men on his right and his left, and he felt himself in an awkward situation that he didn't have support. But both of these young men had volunteered, and they were eager to uh, try to kill Abu Jahl because Abu Jahl had insulted the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and now this was a war and the battle was ongoing. And so they said, either we will die attempting to kill him or we'll kill him and finish him off for having insulted the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Abdul Rahman ibn Auf pointed out Abu Jahl to the two of them. And as soon as he did, the two of them darted through the army and they made their way through the thick and thin of all the fighting. And they raced one another to go from their location, probably a few thousand feet far, far ahead to the location of Abu Jahl. And perhaps it was the will of Allah, the wisdom of Allah, that these two young men, because they were young and because they were unknown, the Quraysh did not think much of them when they saw these little teenagers running around here and there. And they managed to get right to the center of the side of the Quraysh, right to the headquarters of the camp of the Quraysh. And they darted through into the thicket that was being used by Abu Jahl as a protection and a shrub. And the first of the two to get into this area was a lad by the name of Mu'adh ibn Amr ibn al-Jumuh. Mu'adh ibn Amr ibn al-Jumuh, he was from the Ansar and his father was one of the leaders of the tribe of Banu Salama. And uh, he himself had given the second oath of allegiance. He was one of those who had given the second oath of allegiance uh, with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the plains of Mina. And he rushed forth and as soon as he jumped into this thicket, he leaped out with his sword and he tried to cut down Abu Jahl, but he misestimated and all he managed to do was with all his might and force come down on the shin of Abu Jahl right beneath the knee. And in fact, he struck it with such force that the entire bone, it fractured and splintered, just like it was compared to some of the eyewitnesses, they said, just like when you're grinding a mill and those dates and those articles are just flying out of the mill, this is how they compared the shattering of the bone. So it was not a lack of force. The young man here used all of his force, but he was only able to get to the shin and it sliced off the leg of Abu Jahl and Abu Jahl simply collapsed on the ground because of this extreme wound to his body. And when his son Ikrima saw this, Ikrima, as soon as he saw this man darting in and jumping on his father, he too jumped on him and he pulled his sword out and attempted to defend his father, but it was too late for the leg of his father. However, he managed to inflict a very severe blow on Mu'adh. And in fact, he cut off the entire arm of Mu'adh. He cut off the entire arm of Mu'adh in trying to defend his father. And in fact, for the rest of the battle, the arm was dangling. Afra, he was from a very noble family and he also had another brother who died in the Battle of Badr. And eventually he too eventually became a martyr in the Battle of Badr. But Mu'awwad was the second person at this point in time, was the second person rush into this thicket and he found Abu Jahl basically there and he gave him a deadly wound. He managed to inflict upon him a wound that caused Abu Jahl to fall onto his back and he lay there collapsed but not yet dead. He was still breathing. And he, the two of them rushed back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they informed him that they had killed Abu Jahl. And when Mu'ad said he killed him, Mu'awwad became irritated and said, No, Ya Rasulullah, I killed him. And then Mu'ad said, No, Ya Rasulullah, it was me who killed him. And the two of them began verbally exchanging uh, fights over who was the one who had actually killed Abu Jahl. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Do you have your sword still with you? They said, Yes. He said, Show it to me. So they showed him his swords and there was the blood of Abu Jahl on both of the swords. So the Prophet ﷺ said, The both of you have killed Abu Jahl. You have helped one another to uh, kill him. However, as we said, Abu Jahl was not yet dead. He had been mortally wounded, but he was not yet dead. And at the end of the battlefield, the Prophet ﷺ asked, who will go and find out what happened to Abu Jahl? Find out where is his body? And so a number of companions rushed up. This is after the battle is over and the dead are lying everywhere. So they're rushing through the battlefield trying to find where is the body of Abu Jahl? And the first person to find Abu Jahl was none other than Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, by the way, he was not of the Quraysh. He was a slave that the Quraysh had owned. 
And he was somebody who had been humiliated immensely at the hands of Abu Jahl and at the hands of the leaders of Quraysh. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud had been a shepherd for some of the elite and noblemen. And when he embraced Islam, he had to face quite a lot of persecution. And some of it was indeed at the hands of Abu Jahl. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed that this slave or this ex-slave and this ex-shepherd would be the one who comes across Abu Jahl. And Abu Jahl was lying in a ditch at the very last throes of his life. He was still breathing and still conscious, but it is obvious that he's about to die. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud comes up to him and he finds him still alive and he puts his foot on his chest below his throat. This is the worst enemy of Islam. And he tells him, have you now admitted that Allah has disgraced you, O enemy of Allah? Do you admit it now that you have been disgraced? To which Abu Jahl replied right to the very end. And how is this a disgrace? You are a people, you have killed your own blood. In other words, you're fighting, the Quraysh is fighting itself. How is this a disgrace? I haven't disgraced anybody. It's as if he is saying, you have disgraced us. Right to the very end, his stubbornness and his arrogance uh, remained. And so Abu Jahl says, who is the victor? Who has won this battle? And you can tell now that he is really half conscious and half unconscious. He doesn't even know who has won. And so Abdullah bin Mas'ud says, Allah and his messenger are the victors. Allah and his messenger are the victors. And Abu Jahl looks up at Abdullah bin Mas'ud and he says to him, O oh shepherd, O oh little shepherd, have you not stepped on a very high place? You're putting your foot on my neck. Have you not stepped on a very high place? And that was the last thing that he said because Abdullah bin Mas'ud then took his sword and finished him off. He was at the last throes of life anyway and he finally brought his death to him. And he went back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he informed him of his death. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Are you sure by Allah that you have killed him? And three times he questioned him because he was overjoyed that this enemy of Allah had finally been killed. And that was when the Prophet himself went to see the body of Abu Jahl and he saw his dead body lying in the ditch. And he said, all praise be to Allah who has fulfilled his promise and implemented his aid to the Prophet and to the Muslims. And he told the Muslims, this person, Abu Jahl, was the Pharaoh of this nation. This person is the Pharaoh of this nation, meaning he was the leader of evil and he was the main person who prevented people from coming to good. Just like the Pharaoh tried to kill the Bani Israel, just like the Pharaoh tried to persecute so many hundreds and thousands of, of people, it was this man who was the worst enemy to Allah and his messenger. And indeed, if you look at the previous 15 years of the seerah, the previous 15 years, the entire Meccan era, up until the very Battle of Badr, we always find the number one person instigating attack, instigating anger and hatred. In fact, even the Battle of Badr would have been canceled had it not been for the stubbornness and the arrogance of Abu Jahl. Even the Quraysh wanted to go back once the caravan was safe, but it was the arrogance of Abu Jahl. No, we will fight them to the end. And indeed, he did fight them to the end, but not their end, rather his end. And this was the beauty of the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Abu Jahl in his arrogance and in his stubbornness, he continued and continued until that arrogance and stubbornness led to his own death. Also of the people who met uh, an evil end was Umayyah ibn Khalaf. And do you remember who Umayyah ibn Khalaf is? Umayyah ibn Khalaf was the owner of Bilal. And he was the one who would personally himself, not just tell other people, he would personally persecute Bilal and place him in the hot rocks of Mecca and drag him through the streets and put huge boulders on his chest and threaten him that he had better stop saying la ilaha illallah or else he would be killed. And Bilal would say ahadun ahad, ahadun ahad. There is only one God, there is only one God. And this Umayyah ibn Khalaf was the one who also killed Sumayyah, the mother of Yasir. And he killed her in a very, very vulgar and evil manner by shoving a spear up her private parts. This is none other than Umayyah ibn Khalaf who killed so many of these slaves and who was of the most crude and the most vulgar and the most vile and the most evil of the leaders of the Quraysh. Umayyah ibn Khalaf, when he saw the battle was being lost and he saw that there was no hope and victory, he did a cowardly and dastardly deed. He acted like a complete and utter coward and he basically handed himself in. When he saw Abdurrahman ibn Auf pass by, 
And Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, of course, was one of the merchants of Mecca. Abdul Rahman ibn Awf had been a friend to Umayyah back in the days before Islam. And they had been business partners once upon a time, many, many decades ago. So when Umayyah ibn Khalaf saw Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, he called out to him and he said, Oh, Abdul Ilah. Now, Abdul Rahman's name had been Abdul Ilah in the days of Jahiliyyah. And when Islam came, he changed his name to Abdul Rahman. And Ar Rahman is an Islamic name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Quraysh denied this name. And they said, We have never heard of this name. As Allah says in the Quran, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ مُسْجُدُ لِلرَّحْمَانِ قَالُوا وَمَا الرَّحْمَانِ When it is said to them to prostrate to Ar Rahman, they say, Who is Ar Rahman? We don't know who is this Ar Rahman. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala criticized them for rejecting his name, the ever merciful. The Quraysh did not agree and did not accept that Allah is named Ar Rahman. We'll take a short break now and then resume talking about the incidents of the Battle of Badr. Stay with us. Marriage or divorce? What's the Islamic rule? When the husband wants to keep divorce? Solution or problem? Join family system. Down to the Heaven or hell? Big fat deal is a misconception. You choose. Beauty, wealth, family status, virtue. Decide what you want. Decide your choice. Be sad or be happy. It's your choice. Join Dr. Zakir Naik in Better Half or Bitter Half every Saturday at 7 p.m. Saudi Arabia and 8 p.m. UAE on Peace TV. The ambassadors, the ambassadors of peace, of peace from, from different, different parts, parts of the world, of the world who, dedicated who dedicated their lives their to lives convey to the message, message of, peace, of peace, peace came together, came together at the grand 10-day peace, peace conference, conference in, Mumbai in Mumbai with one vision, one vision with one mission. One mission. Hundreds of thousands of people witnessed them, heard them. Now, it's an opportunity for those who miss the live action. I welcome all of you with Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Watch them again in Peace Mission, next on Peace TV. Welcome back. We have been discussing some of the incidents of the Battle of Badr, and we had discussed the death of Abu Jahl, the Fir'aun, or the Pharaoh of this Ummah. Also of the people who met uh, an evil end was Umayyah ibn Khalaf. And do you remember who Umayyah ibn Khalaf is? Umayyah ibn Khalaf was the owner of Bilal. And he was the one who would personally, himself, not just tell other people, he would personally persecute Bilal and place him in the hot rocks of Mecca and drag him through the streets and put huge boulders on his chest and threaten him that he had better stop saying La ilaha illallah or else he would be killed. And Bilal would say, Ahadun Ahad, Ahadun Ahad. There is only one God, there is only one God. And this Umayyah ibn Khalaf was the one who also killed Sumayyah, the mother of Yasir. And he killed her in a very, very vulgar and evil manner by shoving a spear up her private parts. This is none other than Umayyah ibn Khalaf who killed so many of these slaves and who was of the most crude and the most vulgar and the most vile and the most evil of the leaders of the Quraysh. Umayyah ibn Khalaf, when he saw the battle was being lost and he saw that there was no hope and victory, he did a cowardly and dastardly deed. He acted like a complete and utter coward and he basically handed himself in when he saw Abdul Rahman ibn Auf passed by. And Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, of course, was one of the merchants of Mecca. Abdul Rahman ibn Auf had been a friend to Umayyah back in the days before Islam. And they had been business partners once upon a time, many, many decades ago. So when Umayyah ibn Khalaf saw Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, he called out to him and he said, Oh, Abdul Ilah. Now, Abdul Rahman's name had been Abdul Ilah in the days of Jahiliyyah. And when Islam came, he changed his name to Abdul Rahman. And Ar Rahman is an Islamic name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Quraysh denied this name. And they said, We have never heard of this name. As Allah says in the Quran, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ مُسْجُدُ لِلرَّحْمَانِ قَالُوا وَمَا الرَّحْمَانِ When it is said to them to prostrate to Ar Rahman, 
they say, who is Ar-Rahman? We don't know who is this Ar-Rahman. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala criticized them for rejecting his name, the ever merciful. The Quraysh did not agree and did not accept that Allah is named Ar-Rahman. So when Abdul Rahman changed his name, his name was Abdul Ilah, then Umayyah ibn Khalaf said, I'm not going to call you Abdul Rahman. I will always call you by your name, Abdul Ilah. And even on the battlefield, to the last day of his life, he showed this arrogance and stubbornness, even though he needs to surrender. He calls out to him, Oh, Abdul Ilah. So Abdul Rahman sees Umayyah ibn Khalaf. And Abdul Rahman ibn Auf was carrying some armor. And this armor was taken from a person that he had killed on the battlefield. Now let us pause here for a second and remind us that the rules of war at the time and the rules that the Sharia also agreed with for those people at that time was that whoever manages to kill the opponent, then the opponent's armor, the opponent's horse, basically the belongings of the opponent become your property. So this was of the rules of war and the Sharia has approved of it with certain conditions which is not the place to talk about now. So Umayyah ibn Khalaf offered to give Abdul Rahman ibn Auf much more than what he had. And he agreed to basically surrender on the battlefield in order to protect himself and his son. Now, had Abdul Rahman ibn Auf made his way back to the camp of the Muslims, then for sure Umayyah ibn Khalaf and his son would have been complete prisoners of war. And they would have had different rules applied to them. But he was still on the battlefield and he was making his way back. So he, we will literally call it a gray technical area. Are they prisoners of war yet or not? Have they fully surrendered or is there still a chance that they will then kill Abdul Rahman or do something of this nature? It is a, a gray area. And as he's holding their, their two hands and he's walking towards the Muslim camp, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will. See, everything happens by the will of Allah. It's not something that is unplanned. It's not just a coincidence. Out of all of the people in the Muslim army, the one person whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, that Abdul Rahman ibn Auf meet and see face to face, he crosses their path, none other than Bilal, the Abyssinian slave. Now, you put yourself in the place of Bilal. You put yourself in the place of Bilal. Here is this man who has tortured and persecuted you like no other human being can possibly imagine. He has tried to shred your skin to bits and he has burnt you physically and dragged your body in the streets. And he has done so much other evil to you and to other Muslims. And he has killed with his own hands other Muslims. And Bilal was shocked to see Abdul Rahman ibn Auf taking these two as prisoners of war. And he says, are you taking them? Are you taking them? Wallahi, I will not live if they live. These are the leaders of kufr and they have harmed Islam more than anyone else. And that is absolutely true. What they have done to the Muslims, nobody else, not even Abu Jahl did that type of vulgar torture that Umayyah ibn Khalaf did. And so Abdul Rahman ibn Auf tried to calm him down. Now it is true to say, and there's nothing wrong to say, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf was interested in handing them over to the Muslim camp to take them prisoners of war and eventually to collect what was promised of him. And this was a completely permissible transaction. Bilal, on the other hand, would have none of it. He would have none of this. And he said, Wallahi, I will not live if they live. And he began to cry out to the people, O Muslims, O Ansar, O Muhajirun, do you not see Umayyah ibn Khalaf, the leader of Kufr? Wallahi, I will not live if he's allowed to live. And he kept on calling out until the other people of the Muslim army came and surrounded Abdul Rahman ibn Auf with his two prisoners of war, or they were not technically prisoners of war yet. And Abdul Rahman tried to negotiate with Bilal, kept on calming him down. He had none of this. And wallahi, Bilal has every right to be as frustrated and as angry because his anger was for the sake of Allah. His anger was a genuine and legitimate anger. It wasn't just a personal matter. It was a matter of the religion. This was a man who persecuted and killed other people in the name of religion for the sake of religion. This was a man who had no morals whatsoever and he didn't deserve simply because he had some camels. He didn't deserve to continue life in this manner. And so eventually the Muslims took these two and they fought them and they killed them. And Umayyah ibn Khalaf ended a very, very miserable life. And this is indeed the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that even though technically he was a prisoner, but yet he wasn't yet a prisoner. It was a gray area. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will that Bilal meet him. The one person that would not ever have allowed. Many of the Ansar, perhaps some of the Muhajirun would have overlooked Abdul Rahman ibn Auf walking back to the army with these two people. But Bilal was chosen by Allah to intersect their path 
and he would have none of it. And so two of the other senior leaders of the Quraysh uh, was also killed. Another incident in the Battle of Badr, which is a very tragic and sad incident, was that of Abu Ubaidah Amir ibn al-Jarrah. Abu Ubaidah Amir ibn al-Jarrah. And Abu Ubaidah was one of the famous companions and of the people of the Quraysh. And his father, al-Jarrah, his father, al-Jarrah, was fighting in the side of the Quraysh. And Abu Ubaidah, his son, was fighting in the side of the Muslims. And his father, al-Jarrah, had been very, very angry at his son for embracing Islam. And he physically tried to force him back into Islam. And he had done much to harm his own son. And that was one of the reasons why Abu Ubaidah fled away from the persecution of his own father. In fact, his father was so angry and humiliated that his son had left the ways of their ancestors that Al-Jarrah began to target his son Abu Ubaidah. Every time he saw him, he would march towards him, trying to, can you believe this, kill his own son because he had embraced Islam. And Abu Ubaidah, every time he saw his father, he went to another direction. He went to somewhere else so that his father could not see him. He did not want his father to come to him and fight him. He didn't want to fight his own father. So Abu Ubaidah avoided him a number of times in the battle until an occasion arise, arose when Abu Ubaidah, just below and behold, right in front of him was his father charging and attacking with his sword. And he was about to strike down his own son. He was about to kill Abu Ubaidah. Abu Ubaidah had no choice but to defend himself. And in that defense, he struck his own father a blow and it led eventually to his death. And this was, of course, completely in self-defense. And Abu Ubaidah felt extremely lost and grieved at that. And some of uh, the people began to speak and say, how could he have killed his own father? How is it possible that he killed his own father? And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in the Quran, لا تجد قوما يؤمنون بالله واليوم الآخر يوادون من حاد الله ورسوله ولو كانوا آباءهم أو أبناهم أو إخوانهم أو عشيرتهم Allah says it's not possible that you find a group of people who believe in Allah and His Messenger and the last day who have ultimate love and loyalty to those who have openly opposed Allah and His Messenger even if they are their own fathers. These are verses in the very last verses of Surat Al-Mujadala. And basically what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying is this is not any problem. This is a man who tried to kill his own son and his own son is fighting back. This is a man who had so much hatred of the religion, so much animosity of the religion that he wanted to kill his own son simply because of that religion. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you cannot have iman in Allah and then still have ultimate loyalty to those who hate and who oppose Allah and his messenger. And as we had said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi had given the commandment for certain people not to be killed and the most significant of them was his uncle Al-Abbas and Abbas was not harmed at all and handed over safely as a prisoner of war. And by the time the battlefield had ended, the Muslims had over 70 prisoners of war and the Quraysh had no prisoners of war whatsoever. The Muslims had captured over 70 prisoners of war and the Quraysh did not take a single Muslim prisoner of war back to Mecca. This brings us to the conclusion of today's episode. There are still a number of incidents and loose ends to tie up in the Battle of Badr. And inshallah ta'ala, when we come back, we'll resume talking about the Battle of Badr. I hope to see you then. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs> Rain pouring down upon my garden Rhythm for the wind that sings his song I close my eyes and I'm drumming along Rhythm of rain were you answering Quraysh and they darted through into the thicket that was being used by Abu Jahl as a protection and a shrub. And the first of the two to get into this area was a lad by the name of Mu'ad ibn Amr ibn al-Jumuh. Mu'ad ibn Amr ibn al-Jumuh, he was from the Ansar and his father was one of the leaders of the tribe of Banu Salama. And uh, he himself had given the second oath of allegiance. He was one of those who had given the second oath of allegiance uh, with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi on the plains of Mina. And he rushed forth, and as soon as he jumped into this thicket, he leaped out with his sword. 
and he tried to cut down Abu Jahl, this extreme wound to his body. And when his son Ikrima saw this, Ikrima, as soon as he saw this man darting in and jumping on his father, he too jumped on him and he pulled his sword out and attempted to defend his father, but it was too late for the leg of his father. However, he managed to inflict a very severe blow on Mu'adh. And in fact, he cut off the entire arm of Mu'adh. He cut off the entire arm of Mu'adh in trying to defend his father. And in fact, for the rest of the battle, the arm was dangling. Afra, he was from a very noble family. And he also had another brother who died in the battle of Badr and eventually death of Abu Jahl, the most evil person of the Quraysh and the leader of the battle of the side of the pagans. And we had said that Abdul Rahman ibn Awf narrated to us the story of how he died. In the beginning of the battle, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf was surrounded by two young men on his right and his left. And he felt himself in an awkward situation that he didn't have support. But both of these young men had volunteered and they were eager to uh, try to kill Abu Jahl because Abu Jahl had insulted the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and now this was a war and the battle was ongoing and so they said either we will die attempting to kill him or we'll kill him and finish him off for having insulted the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Abdul Rahman ibn Awf pointed out Abu Jahl to the two of them and as soon as he did the two of them darted through the army and they made their way through the thick and thin of all the fighting and they raced one another to go from their location, probably a few thousand feet far, far ahead to the location of Abu Jahl. And perhaps it was the will of Allah, the wisdom of Allah, that these two young men, because they were young and because they were unknown, the Quraysh did not think much of them when they saw these little teenagers running around here and there. And they managed to get right to the center of the side of the Quraysh, right to the headquarters of the camp of the But he misestimated and all he managed to do was with all his might and force come down on the shin of Abu Jahl right beneath the knee and in fact he struck it with such force that the entire bone it fractured and splintered just like it was compared to some of the eyewitnesses as they said just like when you're grinding a mill and those dates and those articles are just flying out of the mill this is how they compared the shattering of the bone so it was not a lack of force the young man here used all of his force but he was only able to get to the shin and it sliced off the leg of Abu Jahl and Abu Jahl simply collapsed on the ground because of 